You got him. These are uh, binary search trees with uh, good amortized behavior. <clears throat> and so, before I talk about it, I want to say a little bit of history, um, how these all came about. So, let me start with, suppose you have a list, right? you have a list of elements. And you have accessing ith element x time i, right? So it's a linked list, so you can only start from before, I mean, from the beginning and go to the ith list. And now I also tell you that, so I have a bunch of accesses, so I have. I want to do m accesses where i th element or x i is accessed f i times. Right? So somehow I know beforehand that I want to maintain this list I, in a list and I know that how many times x i is going to be accessed. So, in particular it is accessed f i times. So, now if I want to, I give you some pre-processing time to organize the list. How would you organize it so that the overall access time is minimized? So, the most frequently accessed list can be? The first, right. So, simply the way to organize to minimize total access time <laughs> is by you know non increasing order, order of frequencies right so if you if you know beforehand that i you know i tell some xi is going to be accessed f i times then take the highest frequency element put it in the first location this is sort of a greedy <coughs> way and one can show that this is the best because if you have some other element in some other different location doing some swap will actually bring down the cost ok. Um, <coughs> so, the ok I am going to leave this, right, this is an exercise essentially you just have to say that if this is not the order you can swap things then you will get a better cost. So, total so what would be the total cost? Would be summation i f i, okay. Um, yeah. No, so uh, assuming now I'm abusing some notation here. So I said using x i takes a phi time. So, let us maybe I should add strictly speaking phi i or something this is the So, whichever has the highest frequency if I call it phi of 1 then accessing that will take me 1 step. So, 1 into f of phi of n and so okay, this is my total cost ok. But now what if I do not know these frequencies, right. So, uh, nobody has told me these frequencies. So, so let us call this static. I mean, why is it static? I will come back to that, but this is the static optimal cost. But let us say I have this elements x1, x2, xn sitting in some order. Now, I am doing these accesses. Okay. So, an adversary calls me for some accessing some element and I spend some time 
but now I, I allow you something. I want it, I, I like what we did in path compression. You know, typically in binary search trees in various data structures, when you are searching, you do not change the data structure. But in path compression, we actually did, right? When you are going to access this element, you go search there and you know, you already spent so much time, you might as well do proportion to the same time and move everybody in that path to be the direct parent, a direct child of the root to help future accesses, right? So similarly, now I say, suppose, you know, suppose xi is sitting somewhere and I am accessing xi, so I am going to spend this much time. After spending this much time, you are allowed to redo, you know, reorder your sequence somehow, okay? So that is what makes it dynamic. You have to come up with the strategy to do this so that, you know, it is going to help future accesses, okay? Now there have been a lot of, um, so I, okay, the first few minutes I am just going to give you some history, story, nothing. So there are various heuristics tried, move to front, um, transpose. So move to front says, okay, after I have gone through accessing all this, just bring xi to the front of the list, okay? And the time would be proportional to the time it takes to access xi, so you have just doubled the cost, but I am going to bring xi to the beginning of the list, okay? It does not help in the worst case because an adversary can ask to access the last element in the array all the time, right? I look at your last array and say, give me that, I want to access that. So in the worst case, it does not help. Um, but people realize this move to front really works in practice, okay? So I mean, there is this notion of what locality of reference in practice, right? You know, if you, let us say if you are accessing a phone number, suddenly you go to a place and you access a phone number, there is a good chance that, that you are going to be accessing it very often, right, for some particular period of time. And so, in particular, if you are going to access the same XI later, the cost is going to be, you know, even after about three, four other accesses, the cost is going to be much better than accessing XI spending I steps, okay. So, somehow you want to. So, people did some expectation analysis over various distributions, things work fine, um, you know, it works very well and um, you know, some average case analysis was done. What Slater and Tarjan in 80 something showed the following. So, what, what, what is, um, Okay, so the cost, let me write down and then I will explain cost of move to front, right, for a C. Is at most some ordered times optimal any other strategy. Okay, maybe if there is time we will actually look at this proof, it is not very hard. So, what this says is that, okay, <coughs> so I have a C, some axis 1 to up to some axis M. Somebody has given me a sequence of m accesses and we start with some list in some order. Now move to friend, we will just go and access the whatever the first location, it will take first element, it will take as much time it requires and then move that element to the friend, okay? And it does that for every element you are asking me to access and we will measure the total cost. That total cost is this is a constant factor of any other strategy you can think of, this dynamic that after accessing you are allowed to do anything you, you want, move, move elements anywhere, but you have to, there is a cost for it, right? And yeah, so they showed that somehow um, this is optimum, you know, some constant factor of 
optimal by any other strategy including for example this that it you know somebody is, which brings all the highly frequent yeah, access element to the brain beginning you know that sort of the static optimal it's um, a constant factor of within any other strategy okay I mean, at this point it could be somewhat vague you know if you follow it fine I mean I did actually define what the costs are but this is an impressive result where I do not need to know the frequencies in advance somehow in a self adjusting way I do my adjustment in the link list so that my overall cost is within the cost of any other strategy ok, 83 or something so. Now, let us translate all of this in uh, in the binary search tree situation where you do not have a link list, you are talking about the search tree. Now, I suppose I know I want to maintain some keys x1 to xn from an ordered set and I am told that x1 is going to be accessed f1 times, x2 is going to be accessed f2 times and xn is going to be accessed fn times. Now, I want to organize this static again right everything is static you are given some pre-processing time. What is the best way to organize your tree so that the total cost is minimized? So, what is the cost of accessing i? It is like the whatever cost in the binary search tree is right. The depth of wherever x i falls in what you know. So, it will be the cost for any tree you build on this would be summation f i into depth of x i in the tree right. You want to come up with that tree that minimizes this right. Do we know how to do it? maximum on the root no it does not work. No, no. So, you are you are the analog analogous thing no because because it is a search tree right because I cannot put elements wherever I want right elements to the left has to be smaller elements on the right have to be right. So, on uh, elements on the right have to be greater. So, let me write this exercise. So, that is greedy whether what is greedy of you know max frequency on the root and recurs does not work it is not very hard ok. Somebody else had an answer. This is one of the classic you know standard dynamic programming example if you have not seen it I am sure it is there in Karman in in um, in the section or in uh, exercises of dynamic programming that you can actually compute this because you know using dynamic program there is an optimal way in you know you run through your frequency this is all static right I have told you everything. So, you are allowed to take whatever time you want to do pre processing. So, basically the idea is I want to choose a root. Right. So, there is a an n cube which can be improved to n square dynamic programming algorithm to compute the optimum cost. In fact, that allows even I might say that anything less than x 1 I may have another frequency you know between here I will give you this pre frequencies even with all that if I have frequencies of all that I can build um, an optimum search tree. So, how do you go about using dynamic programming and once I said people have seen should remember it. Um, so, everything boils down to choosing the root right how many possible choices are there for the root there are n possible choices. So, once I fix the root then whatever on the left should be an optimum binary search tree for all the keys of the left 
and whatever on the right should be an optimum binary search tree on the keys of the right, right. So, you build this optimum binary search tree for every interval of keys bottom up and then you can you know create a table and, and compute this, right. So, again exercise most of you would have should have seen this it is a simple dynamic programming. So, if I have computed the optimum binary search tree for various small intervals for a larger interval you choose your root once you fix a root whatever in the left must be an optimum binary search tree. So, you know you have computed it whatever on the right should be an optimum binary search tree you computed it and you can compute the total cost because you know the depth will now increase. So, you can compute this total cost run over all the roots and pick the one which is minimum and that slowly you can build your interval and finally in you know uh, n square intervals and you can spend linear time for each interval to compute this. This can be improved to n square there is a yeah I mean all of these are important please go and work this out ok and uh, not very hard and you can look up even Carmen's book will have I mean this greedy you should be able to figure it out yourself n cubed algorithm must be there in Carmen's book either in in the chapter or in exercise or somewhere ok and I actually spelt out the entire algorithm for you. So, you just have to work it out right various intervals compute it and, and do that ok. Okay, and it turns out this is another. So, if I know the frequencies I can actually spend some time and compute my optimum binary search tree which minimizes the total cost right. And it turns out here the optimum cost not very surprisingly is proportional to what is called this entropy of this distribution. So, it is summation f i into log m over f i if I am actually doing right. So, summation f i is m. So, I am doing m accesses right if x 1 is accessed f 1 times and so on. Then so, here it is summation f i i here it is summation f i log m over f i right. This is also called you know entropy of your distribution. If you think of this a m over f i um, or f i by m as probability of accessing x i because out of this m accesses I am accessing x i f i times. So, f i by m is the probability of accessing x i then this is 1 over p i right this is p i. So, p i log 1 over p i is exactly so it is actually natural log entropy of this distribution. Right? What is this distribution this f i over m probabilities ok probability of accessing x i is f i over m in my sequence of m axis. Now, the beauty of splay trees which we will see is that we are going to achieve this cost over a sequence of m accesses even without knowing the frequencies in advance right exactly like this kind of a result on the list ok. I mean in fact, we do not know we do not know this for binary search trees something like this uh, that is a major conjecture open problem I will explain all that. So, an analogous result like this for search trees is open we do not know that ok. But what we will show is that even without knowing um, the frequencies splay trees achieve a cost of the splay trees is order static optimal because this is static optimal right. In the case of um, Okay, so, all this is to just sort of 
give the ex and explain this background and, and motivation, then we will actually get to so splay trees. We will show the cost of axis is order static optimal. But the static optimal is something you know the frequencies, you are pre-processing time, you can organize it the way you want, whereas this is sort of dynamic. I do not know the frequencies, as I do some accesses, I am going to do uh, reorganize my tree, uh, but it so happens that it automatically achieves this optimal with the constant factor slowdown. And whether it is order optimal by any other strategy, that is a conjecture, we do not know that. Okay, so this is just to give you uh, a background of all this. So there is a lot of work around this conjecture. Subsequently, you know, this is one of one of the recent current topics of research in uh, data structures. I would say. Okay, so what are self-adjusting or splay trees? So the idea is that we are not going to store any balance information in your search tree. Yeah, it is um, okay. So no, let's let's try something else. So one idea is something like trying to do move to front, right? So So we will try move to root. So what does that mean? Um, so I am doing my search. So this is the key. So I have this huge binary search tree sitting here and I am this is my search path to access this key. Okay. I spend time proportional to the length of this tree which could be you know length of the path height of the tree which could be very large. But after I doing that, somehow since move to front worked, I will do some rotations and move move this to the root of the tree. Okay. So let us actually do it on a just to see the contrast of something which does work we will see. Suppose this is my search tree with values like this and I am accessing 1, so my search path will go through and get to 1. Now I want to do some rotation, remember rotation is what you do in, uh, in balancing binary search trees in avian trees, red black trees. So I will do some rotation, so do a right rotate at 2 here which will make 1 here and 2 here and after doing one rotation, I want to bring 1 to the root, so I will do a right rotation here which will make it, you know, a right rotation, let us do one more and then you will see what is going to happen. So I will have 1 here, 2 and 3, it is a balanced binary search tree, so you have to, ah, I see. Okay, okay, I see. So if I do a right, okay, okay, good point. So maybe this is what, yeah. Thank you, yes. So when I do a right rotation, what happens? 3 becomes, no, 1 becomes the parent, 3 becomes right, and 2 comes to the left, yes. So in general, imagine there is some tree here, and when I am doing a right rotation at y, x will come here and y will come here and then these trees go to their natural place and you can verify that binary search tree property is satisfied, right? okay. So some, yeah, no, no. So we are doing this right rotation. So when you do the right rotation, follow this, right. So you can think of this as, um, so there is a subtree here A, there is a subtree here B and there is a subtree here C which is nothing, okay. So when I do a right rotation, 
A comes here, B which is 2 comes here and C should come here and everything else goes above. Okay, so this, this is a picture you should keep in mind. So you do the rotation, then the 3 becomes a child of 1 and then you stick the remaining subtrees in their natural places. So A, B, C. So this is the tree you will get. So what happens if I just keep doing this one rotation at a time to make 1 to the root, what will happen is the following, right? Um, what will happen? So 1 goes here. nothing much changes to the height of the tree unfortunately. So now an adversary can ask for 2 and you will spend, you will keep on spending. So if I have to access 1, 2, 3 up to n in, in this starting configuration, you are going to spend linear time at every step, okay, over all n square and there is no error and we have no hope of proving something like this because we already know one strategy which is um, log n competitive. What strategy? Right? If I if I have to perform a sequence of operations, I know something like AVL tree or red black tree, these are perfectly you know balanced trees and they can search, insert, delete anything they want in logarithmic time. Right? So if you do a sequence of m operations, then that is going that is going to cost me m log n. Whereas this is going to cost me n all the time. So this is no, you know, because we actually have one strategy which is like, you know, AVL tree or one of those worst case optimal strategies is good and you know, it is not even comparing with that, okay. So again, this was the first experiment. People tried, did some um, expectation analysis, managed to prove something. But what Slater and Tarjan just made one little improvement and all they said is do not look at, do, do not do one rotation at a time, look at paths of length 2 and do rotations and somehow that works, okay. We will see how at least for this path. So their solution I think for nineteen eighty five, this I remember, um, is so you access a node like this, then you know this is X, its parent and its grandparent, then do a rotation which is again move x to the root that is what that is the goal eventually x is going to be the root. So we are going to move to the, the axis node to the root but by looking at paths of length 2 and you will see how what difference it will make. So here what we are going to do is x goes here and p e goes here and c goes here. So if your parent you know if you are a left child of your parent and parent is a left child of your its parent then this is called a zigzag. The other case is that case again x has to come to the root. So it will be p and g, right? You still have binary search tree property. You are doing two rotations and the tree will look like this. So you will have E is less than x and g is greater than x and there are some symmetric cases, right? If uh, if your x, p, g is like this, then you do, you know, if it is like this, you rotate it like this and if this is not the right child but the left child but the parent is the right child of its parent, then you do some very similar rotation. So, there are symmetric cases and there is one last case which they called it zig where I do not have a grandparent at all. And life is simple, you just rotate it to, okay, and these subtrees will hang here. 
okay now why do you think it will make a big difference let's try it on this so so what is the goal or what is the strategy that i'm going to access the node and I, you know this works for insert delete as well once you access the node i have actually traversed a path from the root to that node i'm going to spend that much more time to do bring x to the root but now i'm going to do two rotations at a time in in this controlled manner right so after i do two rotations x will go to something and then i look at two more guys and then do some rotations and eventually reach the root and let's see how um that will turn out for this so i mean i have raised it but what we achieved is that if i am just doing one rotation at a time a big chain will remain a big chain so height hasn't changed but let's if i do two at a time let's see what happens okay so if i am accessing one so 1 2 3 okay the sub trees naturally fall wherever they are 5 6 now i'm going to look at 1 4 5 and do a double rotation so it will become 1 4 5 6 at the top now okay nothing at the one left child so let's so this is my a this is my b so a will go here so and that's how the tree looks like right so if you just okay some sort of folding is happening now when i do one rotation let's let's add one more guy or two more to get an idea okay so you so you get an idea of all this so i'm going to try so now i look at 1 6 and 7 parent and grandparent and do my rotation so it will be 1 6 7 8 at the top nothing to the left of 1 but anything to the this right this whole tree will fall here so that's how the tree happens and then when i do finally i do one rotation where i bring one here eight here and So now the height of the tree is one, two, three, four, five, from eight. So roughly the height has become half of what it was. Okay. So whenever I am accessing deeper and deeper nodes, the height is becoming half of what it was. So you can't do too much of these expensive operations because quickly the tree will balance itself. Okay. so is this is clear so whenever i'm doing an access so start with some arbitrary binary search we will do the same thing for insertion deletion when we want to insert insert follow through the search path insert it and then from there onwards you do your splaying right look at its parent grandparent and depending on whichever template it belongs to i will do the appropriate rotation go bring my access element or the inserted element all the way to the root so sometimes the uh, cost of the operation may be linear like this but it doesn't happen often and what we will show is that the amortized cost of these operations is log n okay so let that's what we'll do now and the rest of the lecture about half an hour i think in the I'll, so is the is the picture clear and then i will actually now try and one more step to show that not only the amortized cost is log n for different distributions it actually does better um 
So in particular, it comes close to the optimum Fi log m by Fi, that entropy of the distribution. Okay. So in particular, you know, it exploits locality of reference, which is that if an element is accessed, it's going to be accessed more often than you know subsequent calls to the same element will be very cheap, and that's yeah. But but in any case, in the worst case. If I am doing a sequence of m such operations, I want to claim that the total time is m log n, where n is the number of elements in the tree. Okay. So, we start with some arbitrary binary search tree and then we will say I am going to do some m accesses and after every access I am going to do these play operations and we will show that the amortized cost is m log n and the way we will show is by using this potential argument. Okay. We will come up with some magic potential, I kept warning you about this, we will come up with some magic potential, plug it into the formula and do some calculations and argue that it all works out fine. Okay. Right, okay. So, So, the claim starting with an n node binary search tree a sequence of m axes. And the way we will um, prove this is we will show that the amortized cost of ith access uh, access operation is some order log n, right? And um, so, what is the formula for the amortized cost using the potential? Function, recall that it is amortized cost is actual cost. So, amortized cost of the ith operation is the potential of the tree after the ith operation minus, right? So, this is this is potential before. Okay. And you are allowed to come up with any potential that works whatever you want to argue as long as it is non negative. And we are we you know we saw very early on in the beginning of this lectures on amortized complexity that if you plug it into the formula then the sum of the amortized cost is an upper bound for the total actual cost. Right. So, I am going to argue that amortized cost is order log n, I have to come up with the potential function. Right? For many of the examples we saw the potential was very natural, you know it is the amount of credit each operation has to come with and you know for multi pop operation on a stack or increment of the counter or Fibonacci heaps various places where we saw this the potential was very natural. Here I mean one can probably come up with some explanation, but here is the potential I am going to define. What is my 5? Okay. So, I have a tree T. For a node x, let us write S of x, the size of the subtree rooted at x. And 
r of x is log of s of x and potential of the tree is summation x in t. That is the potential of the tree. Right? Well, there may be some explanation of why this potential, but for now we are just going to go with this and plug it into the formula and see what happens. So, what, what am I saying? For any node, look at the number of nodes, the size means the number of nodes, right? Number of nodes in the subtree rooted at x and I take a log of that and that is sort of the rank of that node and we sum them for all nodes and that is my potential of the tree, okay. For actual cost, let me actually count the number of rotations done, right. You know, which is proportional to the height of or the depth of the node I am accessing because to in this play operation, to bring it to the root, we make these rotations to bring it to the root, right. So, for, for these kind of operations, we do two rotations at a time, but eventually the number of rotations is the length of the path, right. For the zig operation, it is just one rotation, but that is, I am going to count this, right, okay. So, now I have defined the potential, now I just have to plug it in here and argue that it is at most. So, the claim. So, the claim is this, amortized cost of type operation at most 3 times bank of f x is this. So, I'm I am accessing x, right. So, what is the word? Accessing the node x, right, that is all, that is the operation. And so x has a certain rank value that is r of x. So, this is t i minus 1 and after I access x, x comes to the root and I have this, the tree t i. And the claim is that the amortized cost is at most 3 times rank of x in this tree minus rank of x in this tree, okay. What is rank of t i, t i of x? Hmm? Log of n. Why? Because x has come to the root, remember at the end of this, x has come to the root. So, what is r of x? What is s of x? Number of nodes in the subtree rooted at x, because x is the root, the entire subtree is there, that is n, and r of x is log n, right. So, this is at most, and that is, we will prove the claim, right, because regardless, this is at least 0. So, ignore that. So, this is at most 3 times the log n, and that is what you want to show. right as x is the root of t. Okay, and the way we will show this is by applying this formula for each of these templates, okay, because how, you know, how did, how does t i minus 1 go to t i? Well, actually there are some intermediate steps, right. From t i minus 1, so I will look at x, its parent and its grandparent. Depending on the shape, I am doing some rotation, x moves here and then something here. So, that is some intermediate stage here, okay. 
depending on whatever the template is. If it is you know zigzag, I will do appropriate rotation. If it is zigzag, I will do appropriate rotation. And now what I will do, I will show is that the amortized cost of this particular. So, eventually by performing all these rotations, you will get T i and x will be at the root. Right? So, what I am going to show is that for this alone, the amortized cost which is the actual cost plus the potential difference. What is the actual cost for one of this? Number of rotations. So, if it is a zigzag, two rotations. So, the actual clock cost plus the potential difference between these two intermediate, this tree minus this tree is I am going to show this that most three times the rank of node here minus the rank of node here. Okay, so oh, there is a plus one. We we'll see what, for whatever it's worth. So you'll claim amortized cost of zigzag or zigzag which is equal to the actual cost is 2 plus the potential difference between these two intermediate trees and I am going to show that this is less than or equal to 3 times let us call this r prime x minus where r prime is the rank which is the log of the sum you know size of the subtree of x in this tree minus this ok. All right. Now, I claim that that is sufficient why hmm? telescopic sum why because finally, to move from here to here I do two rotations plus this potential cost. And so, so let us say I do one, two more and I get here, then the actual cost is 2 plus the potential difference plus 2 plus the potential difference here because this intermediate thing cancels out. So, it is actually you know 4 rotations I have done plus potential of this minus potential of this. So, the intermediate things cancel out. So, as you know r prime minus, so the, the r double prime minus r prime plus r prime minus r. So, the r primes cancel out, it will be r double prime minus r of x ok and it just. So, it is enough, I will I'll show this and for amortized cost of the final thing, I am going to show is 3 r prime x minus r x plus 1. So, the finally, I am going to, there is some plus 1 I am going to do, but that is So, it is important that I do not have plus 1 in, in, in each in, in any of this. Why not? Why is it important? Because this plus 1 will add up to proportional to the length of the path which I do not want. Finally, I, I want this. So, the plus 1 is only here in the last zig operation and that happens only once. Right? If I do not have a grandparent then I just do one rotation. Okay? So, all I am left to show is that now go to my template for zigzag, zigzag and zig operations and argue that the amortized cost which is the actual cost plus the potential difference that local potential difference that is much easier to argue right. I am just doing this two path of length 2 I am modifying it and if I argue that the potential difference that plus 2 is at most 3 times you know r prime of x minus r of x then I am done for yeah. So, now I am I am going to get on to proving this. Is, is it clear that everything there is a telescopy sum? Finally, if I show this, it will show this and it will show you a log n amortized cost. Okay, so then this rest rest is all some calculations. So, let us pick 
let us do the simplest thing. So, what, what happens here? There is x and its parent and there is some subtree here, a, b, c are subtrees and I am doing a right rotation and x comes here and p comes here. This is the, the rotation I am doing, the actual cost is 1, this is 1 rotation. Let us look at the amortized cost, right, and the potential difference. So, let us, I am going to call this T, T prime. So, the R values would be R here and R prime here. So, the potential, recall what is potential is sum of the ranks of all the nodes here. Many cancellations happen, right. Why? Well, where are they? Because the subtree A does not change, B does not change, none of these change. Their sizes remain the same, so their ranks remain the same. So, when I do the difference, they cancel out. So, the only ranks that will change are these two guys, right. So, this is equal to whatever R prime of x plus R prime of p minus Yeah, which is less than or equal to r prime x minus r of x, right? Because r prime b is less than or equal to r of p because r of p is the entire thing, r prime does not have x or a. So, r prime so these things cancel out. So, this is less than or equal to 3 into r prime x. I mean, the 3 we really needed for the other case. So, so, the amortized cost is less the actual cost, okay. So, this is the easy case. Let us try and show the zigzag and zigzag. So, I mean notice that there are actually 6 symmetric, I mean there are, I showed you 3 pictures, there are 3 other symmetric cases, right? Left, left, right, right, left, right, right, left and then, Excuse yeah. Can you please uh, repeat how you got that factor of 3, 3 times? Oh, 3, I just, I multiplied by 3, that is all. Basically, this is a positive, I mean R prime x minus R x, I said it is less than or equal to 3 times R prime x minus R x. The 3 does not play any role here, 3 is going to come for the other cases I am going to argue. Right. I'm, all I am saying is some y is less than or equal to 3 times y, that is all. Also, r prime x minus r x is a positive number that is useful. It is greater than or equal to 0 because r prime x has more things than here. And this plus 1 is for the actual cost, right, because amortized cost is actual cost plus the potential difference. Yeah, the other, other cases require a bit to work. Let us do okay. right. Somehow these are, these names, I think they were coined by Slater and Tarjan. So, they are all there, zig, 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 zag and so on. So, it is stuck. So, it is x, parent, grandparent and you are doing rotation. Right. So, this is what the result of the rotation is. So, the actual cost is 2 and the potential difference 
first let me write mechanically what it is because again only three nodes change their potential everything else cancel out also r prime x and r of g are same right so you know there will be more things here by the way okay it need not this need not be the root we have just done some intermediate stuff but still you know this contains all of these guys so r prime x and r of g are same i'm going to cancel that out what else i did okay and r prime p is less than or equal to r prime x because this is smaller and and r of x okay so i've done some cancellation replace this by r prime x and replace p by r of x now the claim is so the amortized cost is 2 plus r prime x plus r prime g minus 2 rx i want to show it's less than or equal to 3 times r prime x minus r Okay, this is require some little calculation use of log as a concave function in some way. So to prove this, what do I have to do? Let's just you know. Um, i'm going to bring terms left and right here and there so i'm going to show that two plus r prime x r prime g plus r of x is less than or equal to 2 r prime x right I'm just doing some jugglery of the terms there Is this, is this fine? So two, I kept r prime g here, and I had minus two r of x, and the minus three r x comes this side and becomes plus r of x, and I've taken the r prime x the other side with the minus, and this is what I'm to show, right? So we'll show this.
So, let us expand it out. We know what is a r right is log of the size and so on, but it will tell you something. So, um, okay. So, 2 r prime x minus r prime z minus r x. No, I want to say the other way. This is log of s prime g by s prime x plus Okay, this is clear. So, what is r prime g? It is log of s prime g, right, just by definition. Rank of a node is log of the sum of the subtree. r of x is log of s of x and r prime x is log of s prime x. So, I am doing minus log s prime x minus log x prime x. So, log of a by b is log a minus log b. So, I bring one s prime x here and one x prime x here. Good. Now, do they make sense? Um, what do we see about s prime of g? Okay. Notice what can you say about s prime g plus s of x? Let us look at the picture, right? There is very particular reason which. So, s of g, sorry, s prime of g and s of x have captured the subtrees a, b, c, d. Right, when I add them all. So, it is I claim that this is less than or equal to s prime x. Agreed? Yeah. Yes, exactly, but it is um, p x g whatever, right. Ah, okay, I have captured everything. So, p is missing. So, I mean s prime x is large basically compared to these two. s prime x has more things. And what is s prime x? The size of x which contains all of this. So, a, b, c, d and it has x and p as well. Okay, but x I have picked up. Yeah, p is an extra thing which it has. So, s prime x is larger. Okay, so just look at the picture and you will get all this. So, now, so what do I have? I, I just want to use some, some property of log. So, what do I have? I have log a plus log b and I, I know that a plus b is less than or equal to 1. Right? This is my a and this is my b and I have log a plus log b, I want an upper bound for it. What do I know about a and b is that their sum is at most 1, right. So, when when does log, what is the maximum value of log a plus log b when, um, when a plus b is less than or equal to 1. Another way to look at it is this is log of a b because log of a plus log of b is log of the product. This is looking like a geometric mean of two numbers, looking like, like because if I put a square root then it is geometric mean, right. And what do I know about geometric mean and arithmetic mean? Geometric mean is less than or equal to arithmetic mean, okay. This is a very useful inequality, it comes up at many places. So, I know that this is less than or equal to log of the arithmetic mean which is a plus b by 2, but this is not quite geometric mean because if I put a half here it is geometric mean. So, this is less than or equal to this. But a plus b is less than or equal to 1. So, it is 2 log half which is equal to minus 2, okay. So, what have I shown? Gamma prime g plus gamma x minus 2 r prime x is at most minus 2, right. So, when I add a plus 2, 
you get what you whatever you want that's what you want to show that so i managed to show that this by this so 2 plus comma this plus this you know bring the 2 here and take it the other side that's exactly what we want okay so some jugglery of and using some property of log function and how the subtrees are and and various things we managed to show that that um, yeah this is what we wanted to show from here it follows that this okay do i really want to go through the other case probably not right it is some um other calculation but let me just write and okay so so in this case we have shown that is at mo- so the 3 actually comes here you know somebody asked where am i bringing in 3 because i want to show that overall there is a plus 1 at the top but everywhere else is at most 3 times so 3 actually comes here it wasn't needed here in fact it is not even needed the other case there it's 2 also And the rotation is x goes to the root. P has to be here. G is here. And here the actual cost is two because we are doing two rotations. And the potential difference is. Come up prime. X will cancel out with gamma of G, so it's gamma prime P plus gamma prime G minus gamma of X and gamma of P. Okay, because the gamma prime of X and gamma of G are the same, we will cancel that out. and we going to write this as for g i'm going to upper bound it by x this remains and gamma of x is less than or equal to gamma of p so in, when i put it in minus it follows like this and the claim is that this is at most 2 times so i know this the actual cost plus the potential difference and add this and, and we have something very similar to this kind of a log function playing a role here so let's write down what do i have to show suffice us to show something like this 2 plus okay not quite um
Oh, I think I'll stick to R prime G. Okay. It suffices to show. So, R prime G, I'm not going to give up. So, R prime G and R prime P are useful because again, this plus this is less than or equal to this sort of, you know, the S prime G plus S of X is less than or equal to S prime X. Similarly, here we know that S prime of P plus S prime of G is less than or equal to S prime of X. So, that's going to be very useful here. So, what do I have to show? That 2 plus r prime g plus r prime p is less than or equal to 2 r prime x. Yeah, so this has a very similar flavor like this and what did we use before that if you look at the subtree rooted at g in t prime subtree rooted at x in t, the, the subtrees they add, they are less than or equal to subtree rooted in S prime and here it is true that S prime of g uh, plus S prime of b is less than or equal to S of x, S prime of x. So, exactly the same kind of argument will tell you that, okay. So, I will leave that as an exercise to complete it. So, net net what have we shown that if you perform these template rotations, the amortized cost is at most 3 r prime x minus. So, to go from here and x was here and moved here, then the total cost is at most 3 r prime x minus r of x. So, this telescopic sum goes all the way and finally, you know there may be a plus 1. So, overall we have 3 and 2 whatever I call it. Plus 1, which is at most 3 log n. So, the, the, the thing is the mystery about the potential, okay. One, one Sanity check is that if you have a long chain of, right. So, okay. So, we are done with the claim of the amortized analysis. I just want to make some two, three remarks. If I have a, a tree like this, what is its potential? Right. So, 1, 2, 3, and 2, n. Summation log i, right, which is n log n factorial, which is n log n, right. So, this is, so this is summation log i, which is equal to log n factorial, which is at most n log n minus n log e and stuff, okay. So, it is so close to n log n, it is asymptotically theta n log n. But if you have a perfectly balanced tree, then you know half the guys are potential 0, these guys are potential 1 and so one can show that if t is like this. Just by computing the summation log thing, right? And this is what you expect. So this is this is a bad scenario for us because the actual cost may be very large, but the tree has enough potential to pay for it, right? That the potential is defined in a way that the tree has enough potential, and the potential drops because of this picture I showed of paths becoming half of what they were, kind of thing. One cannot, and so that is some intuition of why this potential is, but uh, there are also analysis which uses a discrete potential of this, right. What we have used is a continuous potential, potential 
is not an integer because I just said log of the size of the subtree and log need not be an integer. But there are analyses which use floor of the log as a potential. And um, now one can ask, okay, are these the templates that work? What are the kind of rotation rules that gives you a mortised logarithmic bound? There are papers written on them about, you know, what are the properties this um, rotations, this rules have to satisfy. So, it is still, you know, growing area of, you know, understanding why they work, what are the different kinds of rules that work. Finally, I said we, we can actually show that for different distribution, uh, it actually does better uh, close to the entropy. So, so let us say suppose xi is accessed fi times c, right? And so summation fi is m. Right? In my sequence of accesses, let us say you know ith element is accessed some fi times and I have this frequency distribution, then can I write the amortized cost as a function of these fi's? I know that it is at most m log n, but can I say something better? And it turns out you just have to take this entire formula and do something slightly differently and we get. Remember s of x we said is the size of the subtree, right? So, let me just say x is in the tree where this tree is a subtree rooted at x. This, this was our definition of s of x, then we went into r of x which is log of s of x and did the entire potential argument. And finally, our, what we showed is, is you know, but if I change my s of x to something else and still keep my r of x to whatever it was, the whole thing will still go through, okay. So, what I will do is, let me change to the frequency of accessing that node x, okay. So, given this n node tree, a priori for every node I am going to assi assign some weight which is the frequency of access of the node. So, I know suppose it is f i, then I am going to put that f i. Now, s of x is not just the subtree size, sum all the frequencies of the nodes in your subtree and add them all and that is why s of x. Okay. And everything else remains the same and r of x is log of s of x with this new definition of s of x. Now, you know the entire thing goes through, there is really no change because all we did was, oh, when I do these rotations only the potential of these nodes change and we just plugged into the formula and did some you know log calculations, it was all using logs properties and nothing else. So, we still have the amortized cost is at most 3 times ok. And what is r prime x now? x has become the root, let us say at the end x has become the root. So, what is r prime x? Hmm? Log m, yeah. S prime x is m. What is s prime x? It is the size of the subtree rooted at that node x. x has become the root. So, you take the size, but it is not just size, sum of the frequencies. And I told you that sum of the frequencies is m. So, it is the whole thing is m. So, this is log m. And I need an upper bound for r of x, right? So that it fits into the less than or equal to. What can you say upper bound for r of x? Hmm? Log of x, at least that much, right? Because if you look at the subtree, x for all 
you know could be a leaf, but at least it has the weight of f of x, right. So, it is at least log of f of x plus 1, right. If whatever frequency of accessing the node x, this is exactly 3 log m by f of x. But m by f of x is exactly the inverse of the frequency f of x by m, right. The entropy. So, the whole thing if you sum it over all accesses, this is the amortized cost of some accessing x. Now, you sum it over all possible all nodes here, this is exactly this term summation, right. So, so total cost. summation f m or f x log m by f x. Right, for every node, because x is accessed f x times so for f x time this is the cost you are going to do. So, this is exactly um, entropy right, because it is p a window. This is the probability of access f x by m is the probability and m by f x is the inverse of the probability. So, this is at most 3 times the end. So, this is what I mean by that we I do not need to know the frequencies just somehow magically by doing the self adjusting thing. In the worst case for a sequence of operations I have a logarithmic behavior that is the amortized cost is logarithmic, but for a particular query it may be linear in the worst case. And if I have some good distribution then I match the entropy of the distribution. So, this is what you know your optimum binary search tree which would achieve this cost where if I know the frequencies and you organize them in an optimum way you will achieve that cost, but here you are achieving that you know sort of dynamically. Sorry, this is similar to Huffman coding, except now there is an ordering here. Yeah, good, good question. There is some connection to Huffman encoding. Huffman encoding also have some characters, and you have frequencies, and you want to organize the coding. The difference here is that there is an order. In Huffman encoding, I can put anybody anywhere in my tree. Here, I have to put. You know, there is an ordering of the alphabet, so that, that constrains it a little bit more. Okay, good. Stop here. Thank you. So, there are a lot of conjectures I told you about this play trees and you know subsequent work on this related to that. So, if anybody is interested, I can point you out to some literature on this. Yeah.